Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second Seds Online, Seds Online Great Debate. If you're new here, Seds Online is an online platform that hosts uh, weekly webinars as well as teaching resources and conferences. Uh, we additionally host uh, weekly uh, informal meetings called Coffee Breaks on Monday and Thursday in three time zones, uh, Asian, Asian Pacific, uh, Europe, Africa, Middle East, and Americas. And we are here for our second debate, which is going to be about, about sea level rise, ground rift. My name is Orbialik, and I'm your chair for today. The way this is going to go is that we have a poll now, and we would ask everybody to vote. Where do you stand on the question? on the question that this house present, which is syllable rise drowns reef. Uh, please vote that the poll is gonna be open for a while. We're gonna have uh, our speakers coming in, uh, in order. Uh, first speaker is gonna be Elia Samankaso speaking for the motion. Uh, and that's gonna be followed by Peter Burgess against uh, Cecilia Lopez Gomandi uh, speaking for the motion, and then uh, Ted Matheson against the motion. Uh, at that point, we will open the floor for debate. At that time, the chat is going to be open for everybody, and it will be possible to come in, and we would ask you to raise your hand in the participation function. We will let you sh uh, open your video and your mic, and talk to everybody since we're recording this and this is going on mute later. We would prefer you to, to see you and hear you. If you are not comfortable with uh, talking uh, in person, please, in that case, type it into the chat. Uh, make sure it goes to everyone. At that point, we will have rebuttals by both houses and wrap up in another poll where you will be able to see it is say if you've changed your mind about the motion. Okay, and with that, the poll has closed. Into, we're, we're gonna show the results at the end. And uh, Elias, you're on. Thank you all. Thank you all for, for joining. And um, I will go for the, for the motion. And uh, you have been uh, seeing all the newspapers these days or these years with um, the sea level rise and the uh, coral reefs struggling with it. And you see that is topical and uh, we'll in, we will go in to, to this. The, the, the good place to, to start with is the, this diagram by this figure by Schlager a few years ago, quite some time, but it keeps really uh, the best place to, to start with the initiation of reefs and uh, platforms with two end members. If the accumulation rates of these platforms and reefs is higher or equal to silver rise, you will keep up the system and uh, you fill up the, 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 the accommodation space. And if the accu accumulation rates is lower, significantly lower than the sea level rise, you will get the system below the lower limit of the photic zone and you get a drowning. As he put it, it that is a, a paradox because uh, if you look at the different rates, the rates of reefs or individual corals to grow, that these are one order of magnitude higher than any process that creates uh, accommodation space. So that is a paradox. So how to, how to explain, nevertheless, these, these drowning events, we have, I will document some of them here. So the, the main issue will be the rates, the, 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 the speed of, of this uh, sea level rise. If it is very, very high, you will out, outpace the, the growth potential of reefs and you will come to, to drowning. 
And this is best, best realized when you have weather integrations with this rapid melting and this rapid sea level rise, or the rates, I should speak about the, the rates in fact, or where you have important tectonic pulses leading to rapid relative sea level rise. And these are the two main processes I want to, facts I want to, to show here, um, showing you a few examples. Here is um, a diagram where we put a few years ago uh, together the, the, the rates in different systems. And uh, I'm happy to see that uh, Paul Inos is in because we use a lot his database. And interesting for us is the, the framework reefs. You see the, the rates, accumulation rates of uh, framework reefs is between two and 14 millimeters per year. And on the other side, if you look at uh, the example of uh, interglacial 5E, you have rates of sea level around uh, between six and 30 millimeters per year significantly higher. So these are the ones leading to, to, to drownings because the reef cannot uh, keep up, cannot catch up and it uh, stays behind. And you can see here in the nice uh, diagram by ni nice sketch by, by Conrad uh, published uh, in 18, uh, in 85. And I want to show this in, in two examples. One example is uh, from um, the Great Barrier Reef, where they drilled along this uh, transect here on the outer barrier, the inner terraces, middle terraces, and outer terraces. And these are the, the, the cores. And they identified with the dating different uh, various uh, reef growth stages. And I want to show here, I, I don't want to explain all these, but relevant for us is that you have sea level variations and important for the, the present talk is, uh, excuse me, oh, this is too fast. Oop. I wanted to, to use the, the laser in fact. So important for us is uh, the, this phase where you have uh, very, very rapid sea level rise and they coincide with the drowning of all the previous uh, reefs. And, and you see in this example that uh, the, these, these pulses of melting are leading to uh, drowning events. And you see here the different uh, arrows showing the the direction and the gradient of, of sea level rise. And you see that the drowning of reef number three, B and number four are uh, subsequent to very rapid sea level rises. The second example I want to show is the data, database put together by Droxler and uh, Jory uh, recently using different uh, systems in the Indian o Ocean and in the, in the Pacific. And they found that uh, these systems have something in common. They started uh, about 3.3 million years ago with a flat top. And then you, you lose with the sea level rise, the, the growth phase on, on the entire uh, system. You, you get only the, the, the aggradation on the, on the rims and the, the lagoon keeps in, in, uh, in a very, very reduced uh, rate and you get finally to drowning and you fill up the, the space afterwards and the system as we know them today. These are documented in many, many uh, studies and recently in, in drillings from from Maldives, which are conf which which are in agreement, which decided by by the way. So if if you overlay the the evolution on on the sea level, here is the the, the, the curve of the, the sea level with the different uh, phases with the rise and uh, with the falls, and you see that the flat top between three point three and three point one is 
here illustrated with uh, a constant, more or less uh, stable uh, sea level. And then the drowning around three uh, million years is coinciding with the rapid sea level rise. And you see that uh, it is again here confirming what I was uh, saying that the melt water pulses is, is a main driver in, 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 in drowning. But these are not limited to, to interglacials. And I want to show another example from the Cretaceous, known as the warm, warm world, where you don't have these, these uh, ice sheets. And nevertheless, here is the tectonic pulse, the main driver. And uh, just one example, they are, that is uh, the Cretaceous is the, 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 the time, time uh, where, where you have most of, of these drowning events documented in the literature. That is just one example we recently pu uh, published with all. And uh, you see that um, there are different uh, volcanic phases. And on these atolls, you have always uh, repetitively um, uh, reef growing. And they got drawn, drowned always when sea level, here's the sea level curve with the rise to the right. And you see with the sea level rise, you, you obtain the drowning of this, this system repeatedly, showing again that uh, not only the pulses from the interglaciers, but also from the tectonic uh, movements um, can uh, also record the, the, the drowning. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the general curve, uh, whether you look at Helm et al. or the Exxon curve, and you see that the Cretaceous is a, a time where the, the sea level is relatively high and it is rising from the Triassic to reach a paroxysm in, 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 in the Cretaceous. And if you look at the, the data carefully documented in the literature, you have the drow first drownings documented from the Trias, Triassic and they're increasing and the, the, the most, most of the carbonate platforms and reefs, the drowning events are reported from the, from the Cretaceous showing that uh, as I said, the, whether the interglacial pulses or the major tectonic pulses are the driving factors behind uh, the, the drowning in, 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 in reef systems. Ceci would go, get back to, to the other part, to the older systems, so I don't want to uh, anticipate on, on, on this one. So to finish up, you have to sea level rise, just to avoid misunderstanding. The sea level rise is have uh, different facet, uh, facets. So you have uh, you, you reduce the growth potential of reefs because the, you get below the, uh, the active zone of reef growth. You eventually reduce the area of um, reef growth. You expose the system because it's getting deeper to colder, less saline waters. You change the nutrient levels eventually upwelling because the sea level is high and you change of course the oxygen levels and many other factors and these are this is a misunderstanding because once people documented one of these factors they will say no that's not the sea level that is um, uh, the size of the platform or the increase of the nutrients but the main driver behind this leading to drowning is the sea level and that is my my motion here and uh, I leave it with this and encourage you to skip with the yes and those who said no or abstain will join hopefully. Thank you and back to you all. Thank you, Elias. Uh, that was very, that was a very interesting uh, note. And I remind the audience that they are, that we would request them to vote in the end. And at this point I will hand it over to Peter Burgess to sh speak against the motion. Cool, okay, so uh, I, I think Elias has already conceded the point. His last slide made it clear that there is more factors at play than just sea level, and we can debate which one's most dominant, but that's the point, we have to debate. You can't simply say as an a priori assumption that sea level drowns reefs, it's more complicated than that. So just to give you my view, on this. First of all, 
sea level rise is not as simple as it seems just from the expression. We're probably talking overall about relative sea level rise, which has different components, tectonic, eustatic. The eustatic components are the fastest, but those are rare in Earth history, actually. Only about 20% of Phanerozoic time was occupied, well, there, there were big terrestrial ice sheets. And so these fastest rates of eustatic sea level rise and fall were probably only operating for, for that period of time. And Elias has already alluded to this, but that's a significant point because for most of the rest of the time, a healthy reef system or platform system will be able to keep up. And this is the paradox that was first pointed out by Slager back in classic bit of work from 1981. And, you know, I think we all are using this same diagram because it's such a classic piece of work. So he pointed out that based on the growth rates that we observe in recent reef corals, reefs should be able to keep up with even the fastest rates of glacial eustatic sea level rise. And the point is that is referring to healthy reefs, i.e. reefs that are not influenced by other factors like increased temperature, nutrient issues, whatever it is, and you know, recently anthropogenic influences. So the paradox, though, is that we do see lots of drowned carbonate platforms, but that doesn't mean you can simply say that it's, oh, it must be particularly fast sea level that's drowned them. No, it's, that's not the case. What we want to try and understand is what that really fast rate of potential reef growth combined with fast rates of relative sea, sea level rise in some cases, but not most of the time, what does that actually mean for what for understanding the, the broad swathe of Phanerozoic history. Okay, that's what we're really trying to work out. And you know, as you might guess, I'm going to talk about some numerical modeling because I, not, not because I think it's necessarily the best way, but because it introduces an experimental aspect to, to our science that I think is it provides some insight. So this is um work that kind of followed on from what Slager did. I mean, a long time later, this was published in 2012 by Kim et al. And um, they uh, uh, tried to actually model reef growth, platform growth to try and understand this paradox. And they said, carbonate platform evolution is controlled primarily by the water depth and sediment accumulation rate conditions at the onset of relative sea level rise. So you see there, there's a combination of things going on. And they went on to say, the increase in delay time due to the carbonate response to self-organized processes associated with biological colonization increased the chances for platform drowning due to deepening of water depth. So the point from their modeling is they can, they can what, what they've essentially got is a platform that when it's reflooded, it takes time, uh, reflooded by relative sea level rise, it takes time for the platform uh, accumulation rate to, to for, for the platform to be colonized by carbonate producing organisms, for the carbonate production rate to pick up, that that takes time. So there's a lag time. And they showed that that's actually critical on whether or not the platform drowns, right? And, and the difference between keep up and, and drowning, it is to do with the rate of relative sea level rise, but it is also very much to do with the colonization time and these other factors, okay? So this is the important thing. It's not just relative sea level rise, it's other things too. Okay, and... Um, Another thing, another point related to that is we probably shouldn't really be talking just about reefs in this um, present in this in this debate. What we're really talking about are carbonate platforms and platforms are quite a bit more diverse and complicated than just the reef components that are often part of them. OK, and you can see that from these various uh, images in here. So the, the, there's probably a reef at the margin of this lovely Miocene platform in Southeast Asia and, and similarly here. But you can see from a, a modern platform in the Red Sea that it's actually a lot more complicated than just a reef, right? So consequently, the response of carbonate platforms to relative sea level rise is much more varied than just the response of reefs. So I think we should probably be hypothesizing that carbonate platform stacking is a complex function of rates of accommodation creation, rates of sediment production and rates of sediment transport. If we actually have that as a working hypothesis, we're going to make more progress in understanding this than simply assuming that relative sea level or, or glacier eustatic sea level is the primary control, because that is just too simple. And just to 
um, this is some modeling I actually did this morning, which is, is the power of numerical models. You can use them in very quick experiments. So I just ran three different models here with a range of different, uh, the red line is production varying through time. So times on the X axis, there's a sea level curve. I think the amplitude of that is about 50, 100 meters. So, but, but quite long-term oscillations. This is two and a half million years. So you can see the carbonate platform that's produced by that, it's drowned, right? So in this case, we've got slower rates of eustatic oscillations combined with time variable production rates that drowns the platform. If we actually keep the same production rates, but increase the rate of relative sea level rise, increase the amplitude and frequency, we don't drown the platform actually for various reasons that you can explore in the model. And if we add random variations in the carbonate production rate so that it starts off low and, and sort of creeps up and down, but eventually goes higher, we similarly drown the platform apart from these little pinnacles. So the takeaway point from all this without going through all the detail of the modeling is it is more complicated than simply saying sea level drowns reefs. There's just more to it than that. There are more factors involved, which brings me to my final point. Evidence suggests most geological events have multiple, often complex causes. So why is it that we continue as a community, a sediment to fixate on finding just one dominant control? Why do we do this? We kind of know that the earth is complicated and complex. Let's try and embrace that complexity and actually say, no, look, there's more to it than just the one thing. Let's let's be a bit more open minded. Let's consider multiple causes, multiple hypotheses for what those causes might be. And if we have to admit that that leaves us uncertain about why things happen, that is better science than falsely saying it's just one thing and, and saying we're sure it's just one thing when in fact the data don't really prove that it is. And I think with that, I will. Um, rest my point for the minute and and ted is going to i think pick up on several of these points about unhealthy versus healthy reefs and platforms uh, in his um section shortly thank you very much peter went a bit philosophic there but good interesting and interesting and compelling points and to comment against them uh, up next is uh, cecilia lopez gomandi who is gonna talk for the motion. Cecilia, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Um, sharing okay. Screen. You have the stage. Eight minutes. Go. Okay, for sure. Okay, so I'm arguing for the motion that sea level rise does drown reefs. And I'm kind of with Elias in saying that um, it's kind of the main driver in uh, causing them. So we have you know, this Schlager image that you'll probably see again in the next one. And the main concept was, right, that if the rate of sea level right exceeds the rate of accumulation, you will drown the reef. Um, so what are some of these causes of sea level rise? Um, we have, like Elliot said, on the shorter time scale, like ice sheet melting and stuff like that. And then on the longer term scale, we do have like oceanic ridge volume, the formation, you know, seafloor volcanism. Um, and so I'm gonna focus mainly, I have a few examples of past uh, oceanic and oxic events, um, and they have to do with sea level rise. So here we have this, you know, the quintessential Exxon sea level curve that we show sea level uh, rise and fall through time. I'm going to make it a little easier to compare here on the right, which shows kind of the abundance of carbonates through geologic time. So we're just going to switch it. Um, and I'm going to focus in on the Ordovician, where we have really high, the middle Devonian, also quite high sea level, Jurassic and Cretaceous. So we have uh, high sea levels, and this kind of corresponds with actually a lot of carbonates, but it's a little more complicated than that. Usually we like high sea levels for carbonate production, but when does too much of a good thing become bad? Um, I kind of argue here for the oceanic and oxic events. So as sea levels become exceedingly high, we start to actually suffocate these um, reef building uh, organisms. So in the Ordovician, I'm going to have one example, uh, example two here in the Devonian, one in the early Jurassic, and the classic ones that are really exhibited in the Cretaceous. Some of these uh, are parts of actually the, the tail end maybe of uh, extinction events, so they can be so Jurassic that, uh, Jurassic that they can kind of kill off everything. And some of these 
less so, but the main thing here is there's a dip in the dissolved oxygen content because of these high sea levels. So here we have an example of the late Devonian, early Silurian, oceanic anoxic event, and we have a platform ground here in Stephen slash Lafayette. So if you can see over here, this is our site area by Young et al. And you're gonna see kind of this classic thing of the drowning of a carbonate platform. They usually have this positive isotopic dispersion, talking about rapid organic uh, matter burial. And then we'll see here, for those who are familiar with trace metal concentrations, we'll have higher PPM concentrations for both uh, the lithium here in purple and then actually the dadium and the lighter purple, the lithium versus CO2. So all things pointing to anoxia and relative sea level rise. They have a schematic here where they show before the anoxic event, uh, the OMC, so minimum oxygen minimum zone kind of lower down. And then as the sea transgress, we can see this kind of often, if that oxygen, min oxygen minimum zone moves to a more proximal setting and therefore kills off these uh, shallow water carbonates in the shallow shell. So this is kind of how they treat this out. Um, besides looking at geochemical proxies, we have here in the late Devonian uh, transient Permian boundary, there's just also a max extinction. And people can also look at ostracods. So the distribution of ostracods will kind of show the relative stress of each one. And so they're gonna focus more on this, this one right here, this assemblage number four. Um, and the same story, once again, um, we have an oxygen minus, minimum zone, a little more distal, and then looking at the ostracod distribution and which ones are there, we have this intrusion of the oxygen minimum zone because of this transgression. This is documented kind of worldwide. We see this also in Oklahoma and the Woodford Shale as well. Um, moving into the early Jurassic, uh, we also have another uh, oxygen minimum zone, and there's actually a pronounced sea level drop right here before the subsequent sea level rise. Um, so it could be a two-fold punch, but at the end of the day, what we're arguing is that this final sea level rise um, can drown the platform and kill off things because of this uh, oxygen minimum. Moving forward to the Cretaceous, there's actually a few events, if you can remember back to the diagram, so I have to do my viewing of myself. Um, we have run here, oxygen 1A, then we have the B and two, 2 and 3. So this paper actually focuses on the 1, but there's actually many ones. I'll talk about the second one after this. So we have the central Tethys Ocean in like modern day Croatia. And you can see here, these coral reef die-offs are here in red, and they a lot of the time match up with these you know, oxygen minimum zones uh, or ocean and oxygen events during this progressively sea level high. So here we have, um, where they looked at actually the benthic diversity. And the way they measured this, besides looking at some geochemical proxies, is they looked at the predominance of micro pressure. So the reef changes because how we maybe conventionally perceive reefs, the reef builders, they, uh, they struggle and they die off their use oxygen in them. And then the reef changes to be more micro encrusting. Um, and they attributed that to upwelling due to sea level rise, and then suboxia to anoxic waters kind of reaching the platform top, killing off those that are more oxygen dependent. Um, they also used, uh, again, geochemical proxies. This is the one that people typically use. Um, and so right here, you'll see more proxies moving towards more oxygen depleted um, sediments. And then finally, we have the second example of Brazil. This is the OE2. Um, and you'll once again see OE2 here highlighted in gray, a lot of decrease in the benthic, uh, or the biota here, the biological diversity decreasing as a function of more anoxic conditions. And they have another schematic model, which I'm gonna hammer it home. This is the same thing, uh, kind of a sea level low, kind of a uh, regular oxygen minimum zone as sea level rises, a transgression event, flooding surface, and then finally, the sea level rise, remobilizing the nutrients, stressing the system already, and because the sea level is so high, we have uh, die off. So yes, that was the past OEs, and then we talked about more recent things uh, for the ice, and so I have to put the plug into the Bahamas because that's what I study, so 
we're going to the last little bit. I think Ellie really touched on this uh, well, but we're looking at this last transgression. And we looked at two different platforms here, still in the kind of Bahamian system. Um, and this is a paper by Cookus et al., uh, my advisor, but here we have the Great Bahama Bank and then Kesal Bank, just a little bit you know, west of the Great Bahama Bank, that's more you know, famously um, explored. And so they kind of show the bathymetry as a function of sea level rise. And so they say that this poor Kesal Bank, um, as the sea level rose, so we're going from you know, lower sea level here to higher sea level on the right, um, more of the platform became inundated. Whereas the Great Bahama Bank, um, less of it was inundated um, fully. So because of the platform flooding being substantially higher on Kesal Bank, Kesal Bank actually is not as an emergent of a platform as Great Bahama Bank. And so there are just two banks, very close proximity, yet one is not close to sea level, has not built up, it's drowned out relative to Great Bahama Bank. And that has to do with the paleo topography of these actual Video. platforms. Yes. We, we need to cut you off at this point. Okay. It's well, perfect. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> thank you guys. Okay. And now next. Okay. Thank you very much, Cecilia, for making mm -hmm. those arguments. Uh, Ted, you ready? Perfect. Thank you. So I get to kind of continue this part of the debate by building on Peter's points, arguing against the motion. So Peter argued very broad scale, and I'm actually gonna spend my time focusing a little bit more specifically on reefs and platforms and that aspect of this topic. So let's start off with a quick definition of what reef or more broadly carbonate platform drowning actually is. And I like this really simple definition that it's submergence of, um, of the seafloor below the euphotic zone. So basically you take a reef or a platform that is in shallow well lit water where it's capable of producing abundant sediment and you put it below the euphotic zone where it can no longer produce as prolifically. And so in almost every scenario imaginable based on that definition, we have to involve the transition from shallower water in the euphotic zone to deeper water below it. So what I want to get across here is that built into the definition of drowning is the requirement for relative sea level rise or at least apparent relative sea level rise. And I'd argue that this makes the term a little bit misleading because as my key point highlights here, in order to call something drowning or to recognize drowning, it has to be associated with relative sea level rise. But that correlation is not necessarily causation. Relative sea level rise itself is not necessarily the reason why the reef or platform failed to stay within the euphotic zone. And our opponents have argued this point in their slides already. In addition, built into this correlation is the fact that it's an, there's always an easy out by which you can invoke sea level rise as the cause of drowning because you've already identified sea level cause without necessarily going into detail explaining or um, evaluating what the actual causes are. So what our opponents are arguing is, is simply that, that correlation is causation. And that terminology has been used that sea level rise caused platforms or reefs to fail to stay in the euphotic zone. And this simple model shows how that could possibly or theoretically be the case. You take a nice little reef, if sea level rises faster than the reef can grow, then you may drown it. But I'm gonna argue that this is rarely, if ever, really possible. And if it is, it's never the sole reason or factor causing reef drowning. Instead, Peter and I argue that sea level is just one of many potentially interrelated reasons why carbonate platforms or reefs may fall below the euphotic zone. And it's probably not even a very common one at that. So let's argue against the sea level rise as direct, a direct cause for a second. Now, everybody's mentioned that in order for this to be a cause, you need to have sea level rise more rapid than reef growth. And here is a different model, uh, a different figure, I should say, than others that have been shown, showing different rates of sea level rise as a product of different processes that can cause change in the sea level. And so we're looking at the x-axis here. And then on the top, I've put just a couple examples of modern coral reef growth rates. And what you'll note is that these rates are higher than the vast majority of processes that can change sea level, with the maybe sole exception of glacier eustacy. And Elias brought up that point in his opening slides. But I also throw this Tahitian um, data set on here, because this is a series of reefs that over the last 14,000 years have experienced glacier eustatic very rapid sea level rise to the right of actually the edge of this blue line. Yet they have not drowned because these rapid rates of rise were relatively limited in temporal duration 
And so the reefs were able to catch up slightly after, slightly falling behind, right? So glaciosis as maybe the only possible reason you can have sea level that directly drowns a reef isn't even viable in all situations in which it occurs. And I threw together this really simple figure to kind of emphasize that. It shows from Chris Cotese's recent paper when there, broadly speaking, have been ice caps in the rock record or in the past. And then from James and Wood, when there have been major, major skeletal reefs. And then a more nuanced view of reef abundance in the rock record from Kiesling et al. I want you to take three things away from this. One, there's no clear correlation. Two, there are periods like the Neogene to recent where we have both reefs and glaciers. And we have lots of platforms and reefs that have not been drowned despite this glacier used to see. So clearly it's not the be all end all. And we also have periods when we have reefs and no significant glaciation. And so if glacier used to see is only process that can cause really drastic sea level change, how do we invoke drowning in these periods? So let's look at an alternative. And this is to build on the points Peter's made about the nature of the interplay of platform growth and architecture and the vagaries of biogenic sediment production on carbonate reefs by focusing on the health of reefs. We all know that reefs require a fairly uh, narrow range of conditions to live. Low sediment and nutrients or oligotrophic conditions and narrow temperature and salinity ranges as well as well oxygenated water. As soon as you deviate from this Goldilocks zones, reefs are no longer going to be healthy and no longer capable of uh, aggrading or building up at the maximum rates they could without an environmental stress. And so I posit, or I put this little model at the bottom here, which shows a scenario in which you take a healthy reef and without changing sea level, you introduce an environmental stress that degrades the ability of that reef to grow. And then any sea level rise, which is by definition what's required to call this drowning, any sea level relative sea level rise, whether minor, whether substance related, whether something else could potentially drown the reef. So yes, we have drowning. Yes, we have relative sea level rise. Again, we have to by definition of drowning, but that sea level rise is not the cause of the drowning. In this case, it's the environmental stress that's causing the change to the status quo. And so I posit the question here, can we, and do we often enough, attempt to disentangle the environmental stresses, platform accumulation dynamics, and other factors that are associated with the sea level rise that is built into drowning as we recognize it. So let me show you just a few examples quickly where we've done that or various author groups have done that. Here is an example from the Maldives, which is a partially drowned platform. These plyo my or myo pliocene, I should say, platforms and reefs were interpreted by the authors as having drowned due to increased monsoonal activity, which triggered upwelling, which led to eutrophication and drowned the reefs. So in this case, it's not sea level rise that's causing reef drowning, it's nutrients or more broadly speaking, it's climate, or even more broadly speaking than that, it might be the tectonic or oceanographic drivers for the changes in monsoonal activity. But again, it's not sea level that's causing the drowning here. Here's another example from New Caledonia. Here we have reefs that uh, grew off a flooded platform, no correlation between growth, initiation, and sea level, but as they started growing, there was abundant nutrient-rich water, and that caused them to grow quite slowly at first until the outer fringing reef grew up block that nutrient rich water. And then at that point, all of the reefs were able to grow much quickly. Another example in which environmental factors control the ability of reefs to grow as a keep up, catch up and potentially drown. And one final example of a series of modern geos that started as Cretaceous carbonate platforms down here in the stippled area and moved Northwest. They drowned at various points in the last 110 million years, none of which are associated with OAEs or sea level rise according to the authors. Instead, they argue that they all drowned when they moved through a narrow paleo latitude window that had warmer sea surface temperatures or equatorial upwelling. Again, environmental factors, not sea level. So the key takeaway here from both mine and Peter's points and some of our opponent's points is that in general, reef drowning can be caused by any one of a huge number of complexly interrelated causes of which sea level is likely just one very minor player. But the fact that it's built into the definition of drowning can complicate that. So please remember, sea level rise does not drown reefs, and I'd ask you to vote against. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Ted. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will now open the chat uh, and the plat and the stage for everybody else who would like to comment, discuss, 
or raise questions or any other points on the topic. I see in the participant list there are a lot of people with very, very strong opinions on the topic. Uh, so, first, Paul Anus. Uh, All right. Um, I can't appear on video because I'm blocked, but that's your game. Uh, uh, seems... One second, let's see if we can do anything about it. Uh, well, not... Chelsea, can you change that? Not a problem. I say you're better off that way, but um, seems to me we're caught in kind of a semantic argument here, and I'm basically anti-semantic. Um, I'm concerned about the here and now. Are reefs in danger of drowning now because of rise in sea level? And yes, they're being stressed by uh, people. They're being stressed by uh, ocean acidification, um, but uh, sea level rise is a very important component that I'm very concerned is going to drown um, drown the reefs that we have right now. Uh, if we say, oh, well, it was really acidification that drowned them, um, that's maybe beside the point. I mean, it's, it's crucial to the debate, but it's not crucial to the fate of reefs. I guess that's where I'd leave it. Thank you, Paul, for your comments. Anybody else would like to say anything? Uh, Emilia, welcome. Uh, hi, and uh, thanks for a fantastic discussion. Uh, I, um, I have a quite a detailed question to Peter uh, on uh, uh, the argument of uh, self-organizing processes uh, associated with uh, biological colonization because uh, Elias was giving us a very detailed rates. Uh, can we name the rates of these processes uh, under any temporal constraints so we would, could compare with the uh, rates of the sea level that Elias was naming? Can you give us some numbers? Well, in, in that modeling work that Kim et al presented, they, they've got a colonization time here of about two 2.8 thousand years. But, you know, I don't think that is particularly well constrained. And, and the fact that it's self-organizing, I think it's pretty much irrelevant, really. The point is, it takes time for the carbonate producing organisms to reestablish themselves on top of the platform and to get the carbonate factory to the point where it can then keep up as relative sea level keeps on rising. So that, Peter, that's the key thing more than the self-organization, I think. OK, Peter, I'm going to have to stop you here because that's uh... These replies will be later on in the closing arguments. We have a comment from Ross Campbell saying, recent coral bleaching events due to high sea level temperatures in the Persian Gulf seems a good example of an environmental stress correlated with sea level rise. Uh, um, I, yeah, I have a, another question, I guess, to sort of piggyback off of Amelia's question for you, Peter. Um, what about this isn't necessarily arguing one side or the other, sorry for that, but um, I'm just curious in terms of the rates of colonization, can some of the work that others are doing to sort of help reestablish reefs that have been having troubles, has anybody been doing any or making any efforts to try and better understand these colonization rates that you know of? Can I answer that or should should I? Should we uh, well, and let so very quick answer because I yeah I think that that's a question directly for you off of the last one so go ahead so I I, I don't know actually I I've, I've seen modeling studies that use this effect I've never really seen much data that is used to um to you know to um check that they're actually operating at the at, at correctly observed rates. I don't know. I think it's something that we probably need to understand more about. I guess the thing about using modern systems that we're actually recolonizing, it's effectively anthropogenic, isn't it? So whether that would really reflect what happens in the, the you know, the, the, the natural world under geological timescales, I think it's hard to say. Sure. I guess I was mostly thinking of um, just to see like biologically what, uh, what's possible there, but yeah, thanks for the answer. Yeah, and we have one more comment in the chat from Vincent Bonnet. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank for the interesting talk, midweek fun. 
The question may be, in fact, too oriented. I agree that syllable is one of the elements that affect a uh, reef uh, platform growth. Sea level rise get causes, a uh, silver rate get causes that also affect other parameters, temperatures, pH, etc. And it is difficult to decipher the relative impact of these. But sea level is not alone. Uh, if anybody uh, have any more comments to the chat or would like to raise their hand. Uh, Thank you everyone for a, a great talk. Um, my comment is um, related to the rates of sea level change. And, and a lot of, all of the speakers have brought up a, a number of points about, you know, or, or I guess one side is that there are numerous factors um, that can affect uh, reef drowning. But in terms of the, so we've been focusing on, you know, sea level rise. But I was just wondering if if anyone has considered um, the rate in which from going from a low stand to sea level rise. So we can see a precipitous drop in sea level and then a rapid rise in sea level. And I just wonder if if any of our speakers have kind of considered that as a as a parameter because the rapid drop in sea level um, and an increase in restriction on the carbonate platform can significantly affect. Um, biodiversity and then then rapidly rising sea level you're basically changing those those environmental conditions so I was just wondering if, if any of our uh, speakers have a comment on that yeah okay so that will already have to go to the closing arguments uh, Hildegard Vespesl uh, says that was really nice impulses thanks the role of the lagoon also needs to be considered to be in most productive during sea level rise, CEG Malarca during the Miocene. It is not just the reef, but the larger system. I will ask uh, Elias now to come and give his uh, rebuttal and closing arguments. Uh, he will have five minutes. Afterwards, Peter will step in and give his rebuttal. And at that point, we will open the poll again for everybody to comment. Thank you all. Um, from my notes, uh, they are not organized in a logical way, but I, I will take some of the points made by, by Peter and by Ed. First of all, the, the question of the lake time. That is exactly what is well documented in the, in the literature. Often people doing sequence stratigraphy, they found out that um, you have um, the drowning that's documented also by, by, by Schlager. Exactly, super exposure overlined by um, drowning uh, event or, or layer. That, that is normal because you are at uh, zero, the, sea, uh, the, the platform is exposed and the system cannot uh, keep up with uh, the, the sea level rise at that time because uh, you are going from from zero to to sea level rise that that that's explained very well what um, uh, peter was has been arguing ag against because that is exactly an, an argument to 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 say that the sea level is really the the, the driving factor and if you see here another arguments with the with, with the rims. That is exactly the, the, the points we were, we were making, what uh, Ed said for the for the for Tahiti. Uh, you have only the, the rims keeping growing with the, the pinnacles. You don't keep all the system growing exactly because the sea level uh, is rising too fast to keep the entire system growing. That is exactly the arguments uh, for us rather than against. So uh, another point, uh, another point uh, someone made is on 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 the mu multiple causes. That is uh, in one of the exactly here. That is uh, another study with the same, more or less the same group uh, you have been referring to. Uh, led by Christian Bessler. That's something they just pub published a few months ago. 
And you see in, in, in the Maldives, they documented this drowning and the drowning is concomitant with uh, the intensification of, of monsoon. And, and these are well illustrated because you have the, with the sea level rise, you anticipate uh, the, uh, the, the, the currents get and intense and then you remove the, the, the sediments and it's, it keeps prograding, but it is not growing, aggrading any, anymore. And finally you get uh, drowning. So these, these are, you, you cannot make the, the, the correlation between the, the, the cause and the effect. But the problem is that it is a systematic correlation. So that needs an, an explanation. An explanation. And the, the factor always coming up, showing up is the sea level. Whether you have the currents, you have the nutrients, you have a change in salinity, you have change in nutrients. In most cases, the, 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 the driver or the factor which comes up always is, is the, the sea level. That's all, all the arguments are um, not against, but for, for, for our motion, in fact. Then uh, another issue is the, the platform size. Someone raised the, the, the question of the platform size. If the platform is too small and the sea level rise is too high, because the winnowing or on this small system that's well documented in many examples, also from the Triassic in, in the Dolomites, the system cannot keep growing. So whether reefs or not, uh, the entire uh, platform is, is not, cannot grow fast enough because of the winnowing and they get drowned. So all the arguments you put forward are in fact uh, rather uh, for the motion than against the motion. And then the, the, the examples of the Cretaceous with the currents uh, Ed pointed out. That is an, an excellent example to show because all these currents, they are uh, linked to this high level sea level during the Cretaceous. If, if you check again the curve which we just showed, that is the, almost the highest sea level in, in the Phanerozoic. And that is quite exactly, that is not a correlation, just a correlation, but it's a systematic thing we see with this high level. And uh, even you can, you can see, I, I tried to, I didn't show it, but because it is in, in progress, I tried to show the, to, to document the drowning on the platforms going from the Triassic to the Cretaceous, you see an increase, which is exactly correlated to the, the large scale sea level uh, rise at that time. Okay, Elias, I need to cut you off. Okay, thank you. And I think uh, I, I address uh, all the points made by yeah. my colleagues. Uh, meanwhile, uh, John Reimer has been adding some interesting comment, uh, some interesting uh, points in the chat for everybody else to uh, see. And Peter, you get the stage five minutes for your rebuttal arguments. Unmute yourself. I'm unmuted. I think I can do it in less than five minutes. I'll try oh. not to go on, but let's see. Um, so, I mean, this has been really interesting discussion, really, really interesting. And um, this is how I think I would summarize that where we've got to, does sea level rise drown reefs? No, only if by sea level rise, you mean lots of other things too. And we've talked about what those things are, lag time, temperature, nutrients, basically things that change the ability of the reef or the platform top to produce carbonate sediments such that it can keep up with rising relative sea level. So we can only argue, I think, that sea level rise drowns reef if we are willing to assume, and it's an assumption, usually with little direct evidence, that relative sea level rise is the dominant of, se of, of several controls. As soon as you know other things are happening, why would you therefore be, then be able to say sea level rise is the dominant effect? How, how do we decide that? On the basis of what evidence? Making that assumption without sufficient evidence, I think is a bigger problem than just semantics. I don't think it is just an issue of semantics. The problem is if we tend to overstate the importance of relative sea level rise and I live right by the sea so I'm well aware that you know it's a problem for us that sea levels are going to rise but that doesn't mean it's the only problem that we face in our environment at all but if we make that assumption without sufficient evidence that sea level rise is the dominant control we risk ignoring 
more than we should those other factors. And that's what really bothers me about this. In complex systems, you need to really investigate all the potential controls, not just one that you assume and think is dominant, because that's historically what has been the case. And there is an element of that in this, isn't there? Historically, we have always talked about sea level as a dominant control on lots of things. But I don't think we really have the evidence to support that. And I think actually this, this debate has really highlighted it. Um, that's my view of it anyway. So I would say finally, rather than assume one dominant control, let's do something different. Let's embrace the complexity and let's embrace the uncertainty because multiple controls leaves us somewhat uncertain often about how exactly things have worked. And I, you know, I fully accept that. But that uncertainty is not necessarily a bad thing because we can use it as motivation to learn more about how the earth really works. If we're constantly saying, oh, it's this control or that control and that's it, the debate ends, there would be no progress. So I think for the sake of scientific progress, we need to keep a more open mind and actually step away from this assumption of dominant control, dominant control by sea level or lots of other things actually, because this is just one example. Okay, I think I, I have made my point and I will stop. We will now open the poll for everybody to vote and see how your opinions have changed in the aftermath, uh, in the aftermath of having all of these points presented to you. So we have our results for the polls. Chelsea, would you do the honors? Yes, so as you can see, our results shifted quite a bit. So about 20% of you or 19% shifted from um, being for the idea that sea level rise drowns reefs. And now um, that has dropped to about 30%. So uh, I would say both, you know, both parties did a really great job and thank you so much for arguing your points um, very concisely and nicely. Uh, so yeah, we, but we had a quite a big shift in perspective and that's always interesting to see, of course, in these debates, that's why we have scientific debates, right? We don't always wanna sit back on, uh, yeah, sort of sit back and just keep our same our same thoughts and we want to be able to shift people's perspectives and it looks like we did that a little bit today. Yeah. So firstly, thanks for our technical team and thank you for our amazing debater, Peter Burgess, Elias Mancasso, uh, Ted Matheson and Cecilia Lopez-Gomandi. I think it was a very interesting debate. 